go. Let's try that again. You guys still say good morning, even with my microphone off. Good morning. Good to see you all. Hope you're doing well. If you are new or visiting with us, my name is Tim. I'm the lead pastor here. It's a joy and a privilege to step into a space of worship this morning. And I'm not going to lie, we're about to get after it. So let's go. All right. I'm going to pray for us and invite you to bow your heads. And as you do so, it's easy in a morning like this for there to be so much noise, noise that even preceded this moment. And so before I pray, I'm just going to invite you just in the silence of your heart to go to the Lord and ask him uh, what it is that you need this morning to hear. So let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Father God, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be present with us right now. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our needs. And Lord, I pray that through your word this morning that we would learn more and more what it means to behold you, to see your glory and your grace to see the love and the invitation that you have offered to us. And Lord, I pray for every single one of us this morning that we could find rest in an invitation that is already ours and an invitation that you continue to give to us as we seek to find an identity in you. We love you, God, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So if you are new with us, uh, over the last seven weeks, we have been in a series called Identity. And within this series, we've been looking at the cultural narratives of our day, how they've shaped who we are, but even beyond that, we look at the things that Jesus has said about us that redefines us and allows us to find who we were actually made to be. And so over the course of seven weeks, what we've been talking about is in a world that says you are what you do or what you have or what you want or what you feel, what we find through the person and the work of Jesus, that through Jesus, his death and resurrection, that he sees who you are and he declares that in me you are loved, you are forgiven, you are adopted, you are my beloved, you are my child, you are my heir, you are mine. And so what that means is that the basis of your identity in Jesus is not contingent upon what you accomplish or what the world says about you, but on him and what he has done on your behalf. And if that's true, then what that means about identity is that your basis for identity doesn't come from within It doesn't even come from outside of you, but ultimately what Scripture teaches is your identity comes from above. This is why at the beginning of this series, I quoted Augustine, who in his book, Confession, says, to be fully human, we need to find ourselves in relationship to the one who made us and for whom we were made. The whole thesis of this series is if you want to discover who you really are, what you were made for, what health and purpose and integration looks like in your life, it will only come when you learn how to rest your identity in Jesus. Now here's the problem. And this is what I've been saying this entire series. That is all easier said than done. See, we can talk about resting our identity in Jesus, but at the end of the day, what we have to reconcile is the fact that we have competing voices, loves, and desires that exist within us. And so as we finish the series today, here is where I want to leave us. One last I am statement, one last theme. And the statement is this, I am who you say that I am. And what I want to talk about today is how can we, as followers of Jesus, practically live into what we've already been given in Jesus? Like, how does this become a sermon series that moves from the theoretical to the practical? And what does Jesus give to us that can allow us to fully walk into what he has already declared we have access to? And really to that end, it's why we come to this passage in Colossians chapter 3, where what Paul is going to do is give us three practical ways that we can grow and we can mature in our understanding of our identity in Jesus. 
So I got a lot of time today. I know kids, you're hanging out with us. I'm so glad that you're here, but we're going to get after it real quick. Three things. The first thing that Paul says to us of how we grow and rest in our identity of Jesus is we become people who learn how to seek truth. Look at verse 1. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things that are above. Not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So right at the beginning, verse 1, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ. What Paul is implying is, if this is who you are, if this is what you've been given in Jesus, if this is what his death and resurrection have given you access to, then everything I'm about to tell you is how you can now experience it. So what does he say? Well, first he says, to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What Paul is doing is first he is speaking to the positional authority of Jesus in a post-resurrection reality. What I mean by that is after Jesus rose from the grave, it tells us that he ascended into heaven, that he now sits at the right hand of the Father. He now sits on the throne. And so what that means is Jesus' authority in our lives today is the authority of a king. That Jesus has power, real power, and he rules and reigns not only over this world, but he rules and reigns over our hearts. And so the implication is in Jesus, you are placing your identity not in something or someone that is conditional or circumstantial, but in the one who is unconditional and secure. And so here is the implication. There are my lights. I've been waiting for them. I'm like, the sun must shine down right now. Here they are. So here's the implication of what that means. If this is what we have in Jesus, it means that we must become people who learn how to curate our minds, how to index our hearts on the things of Jesus. If you want to grow in your identity of Jesus, then you must think upon the things of Jesus. You must set your mind on the things of Jesus in order for you to understand what is true, both about him and about you as well. John Mark Comer says, we are all being formed every minute of every day. We're all becoming someone, intentional or unintentional, conscious or subconscious, deliberate or haphazard. We're all in the process of becoming a person. The question isn't, are you becoming somebody? The question is, who are you becoming? Simply put, what Paul is getting at, what Comer is referencing is what you give your attention to. Where you put your focus is ultimately going to shape who you become. And I would just ask you this morning, do you have any awareness of what you give your mind to and the ways in which it is shaping you? Let me just kind of give you a snapshot of what concerns me about us as people in general. What, what most studies show is that on average, Americans, all Americans, this is adults, watch five to six hours of TV per day, or they spend five to six hours in front of a screen streaming something. The average millennial spends four hours a day on their phone with the majority of that being spent on social media. So I did a little bit of math, and if you add those two realities up, guess how much time of your life is spent in front of a screen being inundated with the voices of other people. 10 years. A decade of your life is spent. Now, look, for some of you, that probably, that statistic's true. For others of you, you're like, no, that's not me. It probably is more than you want to give yourself credit for. And here's the thing that I want you to reconcile, and here's the thing as a pastor that concerns me. If that's the amount of time, and let's just say some of it's close, that we give to other voices shaping us, how does that stack up related to how much time we spend with the Lord? See, for many of us, we are very comfortable sitting all day scrolling on our phones, but we cannot find 10 minutes of our day to actually just sit before the Lord. And we wonder, what is actually winning our hearts? What is actually winning our mind? Why is it that I find myself susceptible to continue to buy into these lies that are shaping my identity? 
And look, if you hear this today, there's no shame or condemnation. Like, I can binge watch Netflix with the best of them. Like, I fall into this statistic just as much as anybody else. The reason why I bring this up is because I think for the majority of us, we are completely unaware of that reality. We are unaware that there's even another voice that is shaping our identity. And what Paul was saying is that if this is who you are in Jesus, then the way that you live into that is you must set your mind on the truth of Jesus. Dallas Willard says, as we first turned away from God in our thoughts, so it is our th- in our thoughts that the first movements towards the renovation of the heart occur. Thoughts are the place where we can and we must begin to change. I want you to think about Jesus for a second. In particular, I want you to think about Matthew chapter 4. Months ago, I preached on this passage. If you remember Matthew chapter 4, the chapter previously, Jesus is going to be baptized. Remember this? Jesus goes into the water. John the Baptist is going to baptize him. And when Jesus comes out of the water, the voice of God descends upon him. Do you remember what the voice of God says? This is my son in whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Then we get to Matthew 4. The very first thing that Jesus does being inaugurated into ministry is he goes into the wilderness. 40 days praying and fasting. At the end of that 40 days, who shows up? The devil. Thank you, kid. Satan. You, I, I need some call and response. Kids, you can jump into this. Teach these adults how to respond, right? Satan shows up. And what Satan does in that moment is he tries to whisper lies to take Jesus outside of the identity that God has already declared over him. So Satan says, if you do this or if you do that, you'll have more power, more authority, then you will be God. But what does Jesus do in that moment? He resists the lie. He resists the temptation. You remember how he did it? He did it by declaring the truth of God's word. Every time Satan said, give yourself to this, he says, you know that it is written. What is Jesus doing? He's allowing the truth of God to sit above the lie to redefine who he is and how he confronts the identity in the moment that he is in. And friends, the same is true for us as well. If you want to live in your identity in Jesus, then you must understand the truth of God's word and what is declared over your life. See, for a lot of us, we have got to recalibrate. We've got to reorient ourselves to understand what God's word is for. The Bible is not just for information, it is for formation. When you read the Bible, it's not just so that you can think about things that are in Scripture, it is so that you can live in a way where you begin to think Scripture. And in everyday reality, because you know the truth of God, and it gives you the strength to face whatever you're facing. Now look, as I say that, I know that for some of you, like the Bible is the thing that you avoid at all costs, because it can be confusing, it can be difficult. For some of you, your Bible has collected dust for a really long time, and it's almost gotten to the point where you don't even know where to start or how to begin. So let me get super practical just for a moment. Here's what I would do. Pick a Bible up. If you don't have a Bible, you can take one of ours, as we've already said. You can have it. And when you wake up tomorrow, that you just open up one part of the Bible. Pick the book of John. Pick the book of Colossians. Pick 1 John. Start simple. And rather than trying to read the entire Bible, just read a couple verses or read a chapter. And here's what I want you to do. As you read, have a pen with you. And either mark in your Bible. There's nothing sacrilegious about marking in your Bible. It can be a really healthy thing. My Bible's full of marks. Okay? Or if you don't feel great about that, have a journal and just start writing next to it. And every time when you read Scripture, you hear or you see something that's the truth of God. This is who God is. Just underline it. Or write down that truth. And then as you do that, right next to it, because this is true about God, this is now what is true about me. And what I would encourage you to do is over the course of a week, pick one of those verses, just one, and start memorizing it. Start committing it to memory. And then as you get to the next week, pick another verse and start committing it to memory. Why? Because you want to create a Rolodex of the truth of God's word over your life and over your heart so that when temptation comes, when you are prone to buy into the lie, you have it. So for some of you, when you face a moment where you feel anxious, 
or you feel like life isn't going the way that you expected and you are prone to believe, I am a failure. Why am I not what I'm supposed to be? All of a sudden you can be like, oh yeah, Psalm 23, one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's here. He's with me. I can find peace in him. Or maybe for some of you that in moments of despair, in moments of darkness where maybe life isn't going the way that you thought and it's causing you to question, is God really there? Does God really love me? You can pull up a verse. The Lord is near. The Lord upholds things. Therefore, the Lord will not forsake you, nor will the Lord leave you. And you allow the truth to cover the lie to then begin to recalibrate the way that you experience and walk through whatever you're going through. I would just ask you right now, what is winning your heart? What is winning your mind? I'm not encouraging you to read the Bible to fill out some religious checklist. I'm encouraging you to read the Bible because we need the truth of God shaping us. So what Paul says is set your mind on the things above. But the second thing that he does, and this gets a little bit interesting for a moment, he says the second way that we live into our identity is we become people who learn how to kill sin. What does that mean? Look at verse 5. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Why is he telling us this? Jump to verse 9. He says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What Paul is acknowledging is that even though this is who we are in Jesus, And even though that identity is secure, our problem is that there is a war that is raging in us. And the war is this. It's a war between what our desires are versus what our hearts most long for. Do you know that there's a war that is raging in you? And and the war looks vast. Like here's one of the wars that I fight probably on a monthly basis. Like on one level, here's my war. I wanna look like Chris Hemsworth. Like I want the muscles. I want to be intimidating like Thor, but then I really love dessert at the tavern. Like, I really love a good cast iron cookie, sprinkle some ice cream and some chocolate sauce on it, and I'm game. Now, you can look at me, and you already know who won the war, right? It's not happening, okay? Chris, it's not happening for me, all right? And we can laugh about food, but what Paul's getting at is it's much more than just food. That the real war in us is a war of sin, And the war is between what our flesh desires versus what our spirit, and specifically what the spirit of God is impressing on us and who we become. And the point that Paul is making is depending on what you turn towards and what you allow to win out, it is going to shape who you become and shape the identity that you have. C.S. Lewis says this, every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you the part of you that chooses into something a little bit different from what it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices, all your lifelong, you are slowly turning the central thing either into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. To be, to be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state of the other. Our temptation when it comes to sin in our lives is to not understand the war we're actually fighting and therefore to misaddress the way that we interact with sin. And what I've found for a lot of people, including myself, is this is the attitude that we oftentimes adopt with sin in our lives. Number one, we either try to manage it. And so we convince ourselves that we have the ability to overcome sin that exists within us. That if I just had the right method, the right technique, if I had the right filter or the right accountability, then I have the power to overcome sin that exists within me. Or the other way that we misunderstand, and we misunderstand sin in us is we just minimize it. We treat sin as if it's not really that big of a deal. That we look at our sin and we convince ourselves, well, it's just not that bad. Or we tell ourselves relative to the other people that are in our lives, it could be a lot worse. 
Or maybe even, even there's some of us that are here today that we view grace, the grace that we've been given in Jesus is nothing but a get out of jail free card. And so what we've done is we've turned grace on its head and we've just convinced ourselves, well, if that's what grace is, then I can just keep on living in sin because what is the big deal? But here's the problem. When you read this passage, it's not the way that Paul invites us to deal with our sin. See, Paul tends to deal with sin much differently than oftentimes we functionally see it in our lives. And what Paul is saying is the way that you deal with sin is by putting it to death. And the reason why you've got to put sin to death is because sin isn't just disobedience to God, but sin is also separation from God. That when you sin, what you're doing is you're separating yourself, you're moving yourself further from what you already have in Jesus. So the way that you deal with it is you kill it. You almost launch a militant campaign against it to say no more because you see the severity of the sin that exists within you. Now, for some of my hyper-legalistic friends, when you hear something like this, you're going to be prone to misinterpret everything that I've just said. So let me be really clear about what it is to kill sin and what it's not. It means a lot of things, but there's two things that I would really highlight real quickly. Here's how you kill sin properly. Number one, you deal with it by coming to the end of yourself. So if you want to deal with the sin in your life, you have to see sin for what it actually is. You have to see who you truly are apart from God. Within the gospel, what we see is we have been given freedom. We've been given freedom in Jesus, and here's what that freedom should lead to. It should lead to you becoming very honest about who you actually are. Freedom shouldn't lead you to hide from God. It should lead you to greater vulnerability before God. And in that vulnerability, the way that you kill sin is by living with a posture of confession and repentance before God. I think the mistake that most Christians make is they see repentance as a one-time reality. Repentance comes when I have a conversion experience. But what I will tell you is this. Repentance is meant to be a daily posture before the Lord to say, Lord, this is who I am, and therefore this is why I need you. And I will tell you that repentance is not a sign of immaturity in Jesus. It's actually, I believe, a sign of maturity. I will tell you the older I get, the more aware I am of my need for Jesus. Because in his kindness and his grace, little by little, he reveals more and more parts of sin in my life that I was not even aware of to begin with. And here's the deal. It leads me to him, not away from him. But I think the other way that we kill sin is we have to replace our sin with a greater love. We have to replace our sin with a greater love. Paul doesn't just tell us to put sin to death. There's a second movement that he walks us through in this passage. He says that we are to put on a new self, which means that we are invited to rest in a greater love and in a greater rescue. The way that you kill sin is not through behavior modification. The way that you kill sin is by experiencing true forgiveness and love, by finding the love of Jesus more desirous than your sin. I've shared this before, but in a previous job, I mentored a bunch of high school guys. And one of the refrains with high school guys is just struggling with lust and pornography. And so this one day, I had this kid that came up to me, and he's like, Mr. Holly, Mr. Holly, this is so awesome. We decided that we're going to start an accountability group to deal with lust. I'm like, that's awesome, brother. Tell me about it. What do you guys do? And he said, okay, here's what we do. We get together every week, and we talk about what we did or didn't do. And then after we talk about it, we basically point at each other, and we're like, stop doing that. And then we try to do it again next week. And I said, is it working? He's like, kind of, but we're all still struggling. And I said, can I be really honest with you for a minute? He said, absolutely. I said, number one, I'm so proud of you for doing that. Like seriously, I'm so proud of you for living in vulnerability of wanting to grow and change, but I'm concerned that this is not going to work. And the reason why I don't know if it's gonna work is because you're focusing on the wrong thing. The way that you grow out of sin is not by focusing on your sin. It is by replacing your sin with a greater love. And what you have to do is you have to learn how to become the type of person that beholds Jesus. And as you behold Jesus, it allows you to see your sin for what it really is. It allows you to see your sin differently, not as something that you love, but something you want to move away from because there's a greater love that you have begun to walk in because of him. 
That is how change happens. Why? We have to change what we beloved. We have to change what we pursue. We have to change what we focus on. And as we do that, little by little, what Paul says is we take further steps into who we are as Jesus. Final thing that we see in this passage is the way that we walk in our identity in Jesus as we clothe ourselves. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The way that we rest our identity in Jesus is by living in a way where we begin to become more like Jesus. When I was reading this this week, I couldn't help but think about the fruit of the Spirit. There's so much parallel in what Paul was saying in Colossians 3 in the same way that he says it in Galatians 5. Remember the fruit of the Spirit? I preached on this several weeks ago. It says this in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now pay attention to this part. It's exactly the same. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Saying the same thing in Colossians 3. Then he finishes with this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The way that we live into our identity in Jesus is by walking in the Spirit, being led in the Spirit, and by living into the Spirit. Which means this. Number one... It requires us to live our lives with a level of intentionality. Here's the truth. You don't stumble your way into maturity and growth in Jesus. Like You trip your way into it, but you're received on the other end with the Spirit because what you've done is you've created a margin in your life. You've created an intentionality in your life. Why? To actually experience the presence of God, the Spirit of God working in you. And so if you want to grow in Jesus, if you want to rest your identity in Jesus, it's going to require a level of intentionality. What are you intentionally pursuing? You're pursuing the Spirit and then allowing the Spirit to work. And what Paul is basically saying is this. If you want to grow in Jesus, it is not going to come through your willpower, but it's ultimately going to come through the Spirit's power in you. That what you need is you need a greater strength, a greater presence, a greater comfort outside of yourself. And as you continue to pursue him, here's what begins to happen. Little by little, day by day, over the course of a lifetime, you begin to change. And you begin to look more like Jesus. So the point that this passage is trying to make is you already have access to this power and the promises of Jesus today. You already have it. The question is, will you walk in it, and will you receive it, and will you grow as a result of it? I've shared this many times with you all before, but in a previous life when I was in college, I used to be a backpacking guide. So over the course of two summers, I took 20-something trips with high school students, and we would go in the wilderness for six days at a time. And I don't know what your impression of backpacking is, but this is like primitive hiking, right? You carry all your stuff. You eat what you brought. There are no bathrooms. There is no shower. Like, you're not seeing anybody for six days. And so here's the deal. After six days, you are filthy. You smell terrible. It's awesome. All right? But the beauty is you're in a community where everybody is filthy. And so in some ways, you don't actually know how filthy you are. You don't know how dirty you are, how bad you actually smell until you get back to camp. And all of a sudden, you get back to camp, and you become a little bit more aware. And one of the highlights for every kid, I don't care who they were, when they got back to camp was the moment you could go jump into the shower, right? And when you jumped into the shower, that was the first time where you realized, oh, this is bad. Like, I stink. And you just have, I mean, I'm not kidding, layers of dirt just coming off of you at one time, at least I did. And it's glorious, because for the first moment you realize what it feels like to be clean again. Things that we take for granted probably on a daily basis. But here's what's amazing, every time I took one of those trips, here's what I never saw happen, not once. I never saw a kid get clean, 
I never saw a kid walk out of the shower and the first thing that they did was they then put back on the clothes that they were wearing for the last six days. No one ever did it. Here's why. Because those clothes that they were so comfortable in 25 minutes before, after a shower, they saw it for what it truly was. They saw it for the dirt. They saw it for the stink. They saw it and they're like, forget that. I don't want that anymore. That is the essence of what Paul is writing about in this text. When you experience the love and the grace and the acceptance of Jesus, when you live in a way where you have this level of intentionality and you begin to grow in him, what it begins to do is it causes you to look at who you were and say no more. Because what I've been offered in Jesus is so much greater. And friends, can I tell you that there's nothing that you have to do to receive that invitation today other than just to receive it. Like the invitation's already there. The identity has already been declared over you. Now all you have to do is receive and to walk in it. And that is my prayer for you this morning, that you would receive it and that you would grow into who Jesus created you to be. So as I close, I feel like I can't just close this sermon or this series. I feel like in a lot of ways, and I'm just going to share my heart very vulnerably for a moment, I feel like I'm closing a chapter for us. Uh, Some of you know this, some of you don't. Some of you are brand new and you're trying to figure out why I still use my hands like this. You're like, who is this guy? What's going on here? But here's the deal. Tomorrow I am going on sabbatical. And I'm gonna be on sabbatical for the next two months and I'm gonna be out of here for the next two months. And as I've been preparing for that and especially as I've been praying over the last several weeks, I really feel like this is a close to a chapter. It's a close to a chapter both in my life and in my story, but I also believe it's a close to a chapter in the life of our church as well. And here's why I say that. I came to this church three years ago, and I came right in the middle of a pandemic. And I came in a season where there was a lot of transition, there was a lot of hardship, and there was a lot of challenges and questions that we faced about our future. And I feel like for the last three years, if you would ask me, Tim, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to communicate? There's two things that I've wanted to communicate to you. It's this. Number one, following Jesus is really hard. And here's the second thing that I've tried to impart on you. Following Jesus is also really beautiful. It's the most life-changing thing you will ever experience. And I can tell you that over the last three years, I've seen God do miraculous things in this church. I've seen God transform people's lives. I've seen people come to Jesus I've seen this church learn how to dig into vulnerability and honesty and cultivating community. I've seen you all mature in ways that are beyond what I could have ever known how to pray. And I can tell you that over the last three years, this has been the greatest joy of my ministry career. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being that kind of church. And I want to thank you for loving me and my family And I also want to thank you for allowing me, and I believe that you're allowing me to go and rest for two months. But the reason why I think that this is a chapter closing is because when I step back in in August, you may not know this, but this is something that I'm very aware of. We are stepping into a whole new season as a church. We have been planning for the last 18 months to become autonomous, to become an independent church. We've been part of this multi-site reality for a really long time, and come July 1, we will be an independent church. If you've been a part of the journey for a really long time, we've had a hard story, beautiful but hard. And as I've been praying and preparing, not just for when I leave, but for when I come back, the thing that I've been praying about is, God, prepare us to go to wherever it is that you want to take us. And I really believe that for this church and for us and for you, this is the beginning and in some cases the continuation of a beautiful story that God has already been telling for us. So my prayer for us is that when we step back into this next season, when I step back into this thing with you, that we would be a church that wouldn't just exist for ourselves, but we would be a church that would see how the gospel can go forth in the communities that we are part of. That we would be a church that would say, we want more of Jesus. Because we know that we're only scratching the surface of what he has offered to us and what it looks like to begin to grow in him. That we would be a church that would continue to grow in community, that we would cultivate vulnerability and transparency, and we would see our need for one another. And this is not just this lone wolf, isolated thing that we're trying to do by ourselves. 
And my biggest prayer, and the reason why we did this series right before I went out, is that we would be a church that would learn to rest our identity in Jesus. I want to be as clear, and as long as I'm your pastor, I will forever say this. This is not my church. This is not your church. This is his church. And if we are going to live into all of who Jesus has called us to be, then we must learn how to become the people who learn to rest in what he has invited us into. I love you all. I'm so grateful for this church. I'm also really grateful to be gone for two months. I'm not going to lie. And I want you to know that I'm, thank you. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you, and I so, so appreciate the ways that you're praying for us. So let me, to that end, pray, and we'll close this sermon and this series together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you just for the gift that it is. Whether there's a gospel that we've already been invited into, there's a gospel, Lord, that you actually give us access to unconditional love and grace and mercy. And God, I just pray that we would rejoice in that. Lord, that we would rejoice in the fact that this is not up to us, but instead, Lord, you have given us an invitation to walk and to rest in you. And God, I pray that you would teach us more and more what it looks like to grow in you. For those who are here today struggling, struggling in sin, struggling in shame, struggling with voices and lies that have defined who they are, the stories that they've been living, Lord, allow us to experience the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray that as I preach this morning that my words would be met with a spirit of humility and grace because, Lord, that's the posture that we have in our Father. It's not a Father condemning us, but, Lord, it's a Father extending his arms saying, welcome home, son or daughter. You are loved in me. So, God, I pray that right now we would experience that, we would walk in that, we would grow into that reality. We love you. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to continue worshiping this morning through communion. And communion really is the evidence of what we have been given in Jesus. It's a tangible way each week that we come forward and we are reminded this is who we are. This is where security and our acceptance lies, not in ourselves, but in the person, the work of Jesus and what he has done on our behalf. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this now in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup And he said, this cup represents the new covenant of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. That as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. So if you've put your hope and your trust in Jesus, this is a meal for you to receive, to walk in, to celebrate. And my prayer, here's my prayer right now in this moment, that as we come forward, as we continue to sing two more songs, that this would not just be, let's sing the songs to get out of here. But that this would actually be a moment of worship. Say, I want more of that. Lord, teach me, show me, and that we would celebrate what he has done on our behalf. So when you're ready, come forward, eat, drink, and celebrate the finished work of Jesus for you.